G'day guys, welcome back to the football come down for round 13. Always have to think about what round it is. We are moving at a rate of knots at the moment. And if you're unfamiliar, this show is about having a quick review of the weekend that was and largely based on your comments that you left in the community tab of this channel. It was another interesting round. It seems cliche to say that most weeks, uh, but it definitely was an interesting round. A couple of big upsets and we're gonna get straight into it. On the Thursday night, Adelaide took on Richmond and this was you know, a pretty stunning result. Is it the most stunning result of the season? Probably not. But it's up there. It's up there. It's probably just not quite as stunning because Richmond's improvement has definitely been building for the last few weeks. And I've been very impressed with what they've been able to do considering the injury crisis. And I did think things were going to fall away for the Tigers. But, you know, after a pretty good showing in the Dreamtime game, a great showing for, you know, half a game against Geelong, I still think that's an impressive performance. They've capped it off. They've played relentless footy here against the Crows at Adelaide Oval and got the job done by eight points. Now, there's two sides of this story. Adelaide obviously looking a little bit listless at the moment. There's a number of injuries, particularly in their forward half. You know, guys like Phil Thorpe, Rankin, Taylor Walker didn't play, but you know, it's a little bit deeper than that. I think Richmond outhunted them during this game and well and truly earned the victory. Quirky kind of game. You know, Adelaide's midfield is, you know, we, we, there's been a lot of conversation about it all year, looking a little bit one paced and a few positional changes and decisions in this game. You know, the decision to leave out Riley O'Brien and Nankurv is playing really well. The decision to pick a lot of midfielders to play deep forward at various points through this game, I thought it was a little bit questionable. But either way, Richmond just outhunted them, looked better, and impressively, despite being the worst clearance side in the competition, and are still statistically the worst clearance side in the competition, they actually beat Adelaide in this metric to eventually win the game. So we've got a few comments. Tiger Walker says, Richmond are slowly improving. There's no doubt about that. I've been very impressed, like I said, the last you know, month or so. Really following that bad game against the Lions at the Gabba, I think they've shown a lot of fortitude to come back and, you know, win another game that we didn't expect them to. Then we got three skating comments on the Crows. Mike says the Crows need an external review, replace the entire board. Ashy Boy Clips says, are Adelaide the worst team in the competition? And Appropriate Handle says the Crows are killing me. Endless injuries and horrid game style. We have gone backwards at least two years so far in 2024. So I understand the emotion. Like this is, uh, you know, a bit of a shock loss and Adelaide are in a position where they pretty much need to win just about every game to uh, to rescue this season. Not sure about an external review. I don't know if they're there yet. You know, I thought they were pretty solid last year. I think this year it has unraveled, no doubt. I don't think they're the worst side in the competition either. I mean, just a fortnight ago, they beat the Eagles by 100 points, just about, or 99. But I do agree around, you know, the the game style piece and you know some of the selection stuff like I said O'Brien not being picked and uh, you know there's footage on the AFL YouTube channel I think where Kane Coins is pointing out the fact that Darcy Fogarty is playing really high up the ground and he's pretty much their biggest you know aerial threat up forward and then you have guys in the forward line like Dowling and Keys, and I think it might have been Barry who was playing in the forward line and Ned McHenry as well like some of the positional stuff didn't make sense so I definitely understand the criticisms and this is a bad loss. The Bulldogs then got torched by the Brisbane Lions. This uh, this is a result I didn't predict. I thought the Dogs would be too good at home. I think they've been good on their best days and you know quite poor on their worst. And this was one where they pretty much had their asses handed them, particularly in the midfield. Their midfield is very much a barometer for how the Bulldogs are going. When they win the midfield battle, they win the game. They're one of the best clearance sides in the competition. I think that was second on clearance differential going into this game. The midfield, you know, was largely behind their win over Collingwood. They tried to do the same thing against Brisbane, and this is where they got their asses handed to them. Lockie Neal pretty much ran unopposed, 38 possessions, a couple of goals. Bontempelli was heavily tagged by Berry. I think he still had an impact. He had three goals and 19 possessions, but either way, still somewhat held out of the midfield battle. But yeah, strength around the contest was where Brisbane won this game. At halftime, they were winning the clearance count 30 to 13. And like I said, this was the number two team in the league for clearance differential and the Lions beat them at their own game. There were no comments on that particular game. So we'll move on to Hawthorne and GWS and Hawthorne's magic run continues. This was a really good game. Probably probably game of the round, definitely. They were 19 points down at halftime. They surged in the third quarter. Game was all even with about a minute to go, I think. James Sicily gets bumped after he disposes of it. Hawthorne get a somewhat controversial free kick and eventually win the game by six points thanks to Luke Bruce. Was it the right call? Um, it's hard to know. Like, I think technically it was a late bump and technically probably is by letter of the law the rule, but it was very, very slightly late and I feel like it was a little bit of a harsh way to lose the game but nonetheless the Hawks are playing really good footy they won five of the last six we've got a few comments here so Fallow7783 says Hawthorne would be inside the top eight in power rankings you can make an argument for Richmond in 16th as well yes I need to well I'll sit down and actually release my power rankings this week but it's hard to imagine Hawthorne don't feature in the top eight History of Apple says Hawthorne are a genuine finals chance. I actually think that's true. Like, if you look at the teams above them, right, they are one game out of the top eight um, behind GWS, who sit in eighth, but they are 24%. But, I mean, 
If they were playing any of the Bulldogs, Melbourne, Gold Coast, GWS, and potentially even Fremantle, I'd be tipping them. They've had such an upsurge in form that at the moment, like you can't rule them out. 88% yes, but they could still make it, I think. Riley Burke says, Hawthorne are better than people think after that win versus the Giants. We cannot change the past, but if we kick straight versus Essendon and we don't miss the goals versus Collingwood and Port, we sit top four. I do worry about a form slump though. So yeah, that, that is quite crazy. I mean, I'm sure every team could look at close games they've lost and say, well, we should be a little bit higher. But I do think Hawthorne, there's been such a dichotomy between their first five weeks and the way they're playing right now that I'm not going to put a limit on them. And Ash Boy also says, will Hawks play finals? Ooh, will they? I'm not too sure. I think with a young side, it's hard to back them in um, to not have another form slump as Riley points out as well. Like it's possible considering that you know they definitely started the season really slowly. Are they going to be consistent? I wouldn't bet on them playing finals, but I can definitely see it. And they're definitely a finals quality side as it currently stands. Real Swift says, if you discount the first couple of rounds of the year, you'd have to say the Hawks would be in the mix for a home final. Yeah, I mean, that's probably true. But again, you could say that about so many teams. You eliminate their worst performances and they would be looking a little bit better, wouldn't they? On Saturday afternoon, the Eagles were undone by North Melbourne at Optus Stadium. North Melbourne taking their first four points of the season in a pretty good performance. I mean, it has to be said that they were the better team for probably, you know, three quarters. West Coast dominated the last quarter, but ultimately, you know, North Melbourne were better for longer. Jai Simkin really stood up for the Roos, I thought. You know, there's been a bit of criticism about, you know, his leadership at various points this year, and he was fantastic. The Eagles midfield could not cope with what North Melbourne were doing. I think Elliot Yo sort of stepped up in the last quarter. Looking at the stats, he didn't get a lot of time on ball, I don't think, until the end. And they almost came back and won, which is, you know, something. But regardless, I think North Melbourne were better for longer and deserved to win. You know, they had 47 more disposals, 25 more tackles. West Coast won the hit out somewhat comfortably, and yet North Melbourne smashed the Eagles midfield, winning 48 clearances to 30. So quite a bit has been said about the, the late Elliot Yo free kick, but we'll get into that. So we've got a few comments here. Zelma Zam says, Frio bye, good win North. I, I thought there might be a Fremantle fan who would comment. Danny Dark says, Yo definitely wasn't holding the ball, but God knows that did not cost us the game. Our effort did. Um, I half agree. I think, you know, some of the commentary has been fair on it. He technically dragged the ball in, but it is. I still think it's produced an absurd result where that shouldn't be holding the ball. But maybe technically letter of the law it is, but I think it's produced a silly outcome here where... Yo grabs the ball and he tries to stand up and he gets tackled. And I don't, I would contrast that to a player who drags it in and, you know, makes no effort. I don't think, I don't think it was a good result, but at the end of the day, I, I don't really know if it cost West Coast the game. Max Hansen says, the moment West Coast had any level of expectation, they crumbled. Prior to the D's win, they were great. Post that game, when there is expectation and pressure to perform, they have been poor. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's hard to defeat that hypothesis based on this year. That's probably true. Is it that? Is it correlation or causation? I, I think it might just be that the Eagles look pretty zapped after a, a big emotional win against the D's. They also weren't very good against the Gold Coast Suns, you know, the week after beating Fremantle. And in the Fremantle win, West Coast didn't have expectations. So it's hard to hard to challenge that. But at the moment, I think the boys look tired and flat and, you know, rely heavily on some of their best players. And when you take out some dynamic midfielders, I think West Coast midfield gets exposed for not being very good. Sean Christie says, what has happened to the confidence and swagger that West Coast had? Why is there so much inconsistency in umpiring? Why are coaches afraid to comment on poor umpiring? other than the obvious sanctions. So on the on the confidence and swagger piece, I do, I do just think that's kind of just a natural cycle that West Coast are going through at the moment. As for the coaches commenting on umpiring, I think based on like, oh, well, I particularly watched Adam Simpson's press conference and he was asked about the LEO decision and he could not have made it more clear without answering the question what he thought of the decision. And it's quite clear that they are instructed not to comment but he kind of made it very obvious how he felt anyway. So that is why coaches are afraid. I think there will be sanctions like you point out. Rereading your comment, I think you already know that. You're probably more just questioning why that is the case. I don't know. I suppose there's probably other means for coaches and clubs to give feedback on umpiring decisions rather than through the media. So I kind of get that, I guess. The Saints then got a three-point narrow win over the Gold Coast Suns. Again, I got this tip wrong. So the Saints have won two on the bounce. The Suns have now lost 13 consecutive away games. Their form this year is, is quite interesting. It's seven home wins, I think, and six away losses. And apparently in five and a half years, Gold Coast has only won 10 times outside of the Gold Coast. This game also had a con controversial ending. You know, Mac Andrew got penalized for holding Max King off the ball. 
I think this was genuinely the wrong decision. I don't think this was... I would absolutely hate my team to lose a game based on this decision. So I'm just going to call it, as I said. I think that was the wrong decision. It's really unfortunate for the Suns. But either way, the Saints, you know, they did what the Saints do when they're playing well, and that's restrict their opposition. What did they kick? 48. I think that's Gold Coast's second lowest score this year. They were dominant aerially. You know, I think they had something like 137 marks, which is obscene, like... I think Fremantle got like 120 or 140 against Melbourne and they won that game by 100 points. And what is typical for St Kilda is they might be able to restrict their opposition, but they only scored 51 points themselves. Nonetheless, they still had some good contributors. Wanganeen Miller continues a great season, 28 possessions, really good for the second week in a row. Sinclair was great. Rowan Marshall was great. Windhager also did a really good job, again, for the second week in a row. So he, he shot out Harley Reid, obviously. And he's done the same thing to Took Miller, just the 14 possessions. And Windhager is quietly... You know, he's a player that I quite like. Sam Flanders had an enormous game, by the way. 42 possessions. Really, really rewarding me for picking him in my fantasy team, i got to say. Real Swift has a comment. St Kilda are better than their record. They've lost so many 50-50 games. So, yeah, I went back and had a look. They've had five losses by under 10 points, or 10 points or less. They had the Cats at GMHBA. They had the Bombers. They had the Giants, the Power, and the Hawks. So, I guess you're right. I still don't think they're playing particularly well. I don't think their game plan is clicking at the moment you know they're defensively sound and not doing too much the other way which is costing them but you're right you're technically right like five games under 10 points i suppose that is somewhat promising that they're not too far off the mark and if they had they won two to three out of those they'd be much higher at the ladder but still in general probably underperforming the next game sydney were too good for the cats it was a weird game topsy-turvy i think the cats kicked the first six and uh, really making me question my tip there. I did think that Cats might have a chance just because it's Geelong, you know. And then Sydney clicked into the gear that we've seen so much this year. And they now sit 11-1. and one, And this is apparently their best start to a season since 1935. In a strange way, it was probably the best Cats performance we've also seen in five weeks or so. I mean, they got 35 points up in the second quarter against the Swans on their home decks. So there's something to be gained from that. And, you know, Sydney are just so far above the rest of the competition right now. It doesn't mean that they're absolutely going to win the flag, but you know, it just feels like one of those seasons where if they continue like this, they might be one of the most dominant premiers ever, but we are only early in the season. I'm just saying so far, there's a huge gap between them and the rest. Just getting regular contributions from so many different ways that they can hurt the opposition. You know, Goulden, Chad Warner, Isaac Heaney, all prolific in this game. Brody Grundy's also continuing a really good season. The Swans have now won all six of their games at the SCG this year by an average of six goals. They've turned this into a fortress. That bodes well in a season where they're probably gonna get at least two home finals. You think that is the way their season is trending. Got a couple of comments. Magpie says, Grundy is the key to the Swans' success. And Real Swift says, without things are trending, the Swans could roll into September and take the Premiership with little trouble. So as for Grundy, having a great season, probably an important cog. But like I said, there's just so many good players in that Sydney team. And you think back to the start of the year where they were missing, I think it was Mills and then they recruited Adams and I think he got injured. I'm actually starting to forget the specifics, but they had some injuries and they have just not batted an eyelid at all. As for them rolling into September, like I said, I kind of touched on that, but they do look so far ahead of the competition. But there's there's been a couple of times in the past, well, I think back to 2018 and everyone said midway through the year, Richmond were absolutely going to win the flag. And I'd started True Footy at the time and I did make the comment, the last time we felt this confident about the Premier was Geelong and 08, and they didn't win. And funnily enough, in 2018, obviously, Richmond didn't win. Now, we've had a couple of premiers since where it probably has been a little bit forecasted. Like, Melbourne was probably always the best team in 2021. Collingwood last year also was probably always the number one seed. But funny things do happen, and I uh, wouldn't be surprised if things get shaken up a little towards the end of the season. Essendon were beaten by Carlton by 26 points. That was the next game that happened. Feels like Essendon did a lot right in this game, but they're conversion and their forward line efficiency continues to be a bit of a problem for them and it's not a talent issue it just seems to be a system issue but Carlton were far too good for less opportunities I think looking at the score line you know really helps make that case quite easily 15 goals 6 so 21 shots at goal to 9 goals 16 and you know Carlton were just far too good I think the pleasing thing for the Blues in this game is probably the even performances you know we know Patrick Cripps is fantastic we know Sam Walsh is having a great season um, neither were necessarily their best players by any stretch in this game Tonda Coning was great I think he had 11 clearances. George Hewitt. Overall, this is a really good win for the Blues. You know, they wasn't that long ago they were sitting outside the eight, and now I know that not every team has played the same amount of games, and they sit second on the ladder and are starting to look once again like a premiership contender. Sean says, Essendon can dominate teams but can't put it on the scoreboard at all. Yeah, I think there's definitely some truth to that. I think they're struggling a little bit structurally, and they're actually the third team in the comp for inside 50 differential. They also sit third on the ladder, so that kind of makes sense, but they're getting the ball inside 50 more than their opposition quite consistently. And they are winning games, but in this game in particular, it just felt like 
they couldn't quite put the score on the, on the board. And you look at their percentage for a team that's sitting in third and you know, that all checks out. And finally, Collingwood played Melbourne uh, earlier today as I record this and the King's birthday clash. And I feel so silly for tipping Melbourne. I just thought that we'd get a response from them and they were well beaten in this game. And, you know, Nick Dacos didn't even have a big impact. I think Neil Bullen went to him and kept him to 15 possessions. I know he was subbed out towards the end. And I think the pleasing thing for Collingwood here is similar to what I said about Carlton. There was other contributors that stood up. You know, Chris was great. Josh Dacos was probably their best on ground, in my opinion. Kruger came in and kicked three goals. Harvey Harrison, you know, they're getting a lot out of these bit part players. Maybe bit part's not the right word. Maybe that's a little bit rude. But I think, you know, players that are largely unheralded, Joe Richards, you know, a few weeks back, I think they're getting a lot out of these sorts of players. And I think that speaks to a good system, which we already knew was the case. The Demons run a form is absolutely dire. You know, I, it started with that loss against West Coast in Perth. I, you know, it's hard to not be biased, but I don't think that the Ds played horrifically. But you look at their form since then, and I think this was a very listless performance. I think they should have got a lot closer to a Collingwood side that had six premiership players missing, including Jordan Degoe, Scott Penelbury, Tom Mitchell, Jamie Elliott, and Brody Majacek. Oh, and Mason Cox as well. They didn't even really get close, and they probably had some efficiency issues as well. I think Fritch and Pickett combined for three goals, eight or something like that. So 11 shots at goal for three goals and kicked six goals, 15. So they probably should have gotten closer, but they just don't look great at the moment. We've got a number of general comments here that I'll use to finish off the video. So Max Hansen says inaccuracy kills. Uh, eight goals, 17 for the Eagles with six more scoring shots. Nine goals, 16 for the Bombers with one less scoring shot. And six goals, 15 for the Ds with two more scoring shots, uh, all ending in losses. I mean, that's a good point. It is hard to quantify, like, what are the quality of shots on goal? Like, what's their expected score? But it is a very good observation either way, Max. Yeah, that, that was a tale of this round. And another common theme for this round is umpiring, at least conversation about umpiring. So AFL Snap says the amount of controversy there has to be this round. The downfield free in Hawthorne GWS, Yo holding the ball and King getting held. Yeah. Again, I've sort of already commented my thoughts on those individually, but you're right. There is a lot of controversy. Mikrob says umpires are getting worse. Idan Prakash says umpires continue to be inconsistent and frustrate fans, but don't get dropped after some very poor performances. And Richard the Cat says holding the ball rule is inconsistent. In a game, one team can have a player that spun 360 without trying to get rid of the ball, yet the other team will get called holding the ball as soon as they are tackled. Hard to disagree with this. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's also tricky when the interpretation changes on the fly. And you hear coaches talk about this as well. They're frustrated with the language and the conversation around it changes throughout the season. I mean, umpires are only human. I just think, you know, it's a moving target at the moment. And yeah, it feels like so many of us are frustrated with the umpiring performances that happened this weekend in particular. And it's only getting worse with ever-changing rules. But anyway, guys, that will wrap up this particular round of the football come down. I thank you for your contributions. You guys make this show. It was, uh, you know, we had a lot of contributions this week and hopefully Hopefully we'll see you next week in next week's episode too. But for now, I thank you. I say goodbye. Cheers.